12.05 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM. It's Wednesday. That means it's Joe's Deckler Day, helping seniors of Brevard. Good afternoon, Joe, and uh, welcome on into your show. <laughs> Thank you, John, and thank you for running the panel today. Um, you know, helping seniors is, is a program, and even before I even tell you what it's about, I want to welcome the guy on the other end of the phone there. Welcome, Dr. Sheldon. I like Got that. It. I like that laugh. And, you know, when you get to be eighty years old like you are, it's really nice to hear somebody have a nice laugh like that. <laughs> wait, wait, how, how old am I? Well, maybe seventy or sixty. All right, good thing. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll let it go at that. Well, let me get back to what I was talking about. I was talking about helping seniors, and that's really what we're talking about. We're not here to talk about Doctor Sheldon today. We're here to talk about helping seniors. And Helping Seniors is a program, folks, that was thought up, addressed, talked about, and then founded back in 2011 when we realized that um, seniors needed to have a continuing source of information, information that would educate them, information that would tell them about services available, and tell them how to access and connect to these services. Now, there are several organizations in Brevard County that do that, but over the years I've found that there's a tendency for the organizations, and there are just really a couple of them, um, 211, our organization and Aging Matters, we sort of refer clients to each other, and nobody has a market lead on knowledge. Uh, the more important uh, subject seems to be, the more important it uh, seems to be able to get the topic uh, out on the air so people can understand. But the way we do this is we do it through our radio, television, and printed media. And sponsors are the ones that make all this possible here in Broad County. And those of you that read Hometown News, and there's something like 79,000 to 80,000 copies of that printed for Broad County, and I hope more of you uh, take your time to get copies of that paper on Friday and read about it because it, it talks about local news, Lee, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later today because I know you also have an affinity for, for trying to get people to do a better job of understanding what's available in their own community so we can help each other. But with that, you are an orthodontist, correct? I'm a periodontist. Okay, but you do a lot of you do a lot of reading, a lot of talking, and a lot of thinking about all the things that go into making up for good nutrition and things that we need to ingest into our bodies over the years. And you and I both know that in your 80s and 90s is not the time to attack these problems that we have with our body. The time to attack it is in our teens and 20s and 30s, correct? Yeah, I mean, you're trying to make up for things when you're older that you didn't do correctly when you were younger. So, yes, correct. I mean, if we've got teenagers or people in their 20s and 30s listening right now, the things that you do right now are going to affect what you do in the future tremendously and how, 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 how good you're feeling and how healthy you are. I've got an example for you. I saw a 16-year-old yesterday, Joe, 16-year-old in my practice, who had just completed braces but was eating sugar all the time was drinking Coke, was having gummy candies, and didn't brush his teeth well. And now I have eight rotten teeth to deal with at the age of 16. Can you imagine what, how that's going to affect him in his 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s? Well, now that you mention it, and what you and I talk about over the years, you have discovered this at, at an early age. Uh, but can't you do a lot to improve his chances for having good teeth in the tw 20s and 30s? I can, but I can't do any more than the patient is willing to do himself. 
In other words, we're really good at repairing. But to put dental implants into a 16-year-old, I don't think that's the right thing to do. No, I agree. I don't know how long those dental implants are going to last. And if the implants fail, and they will sometime in his lifetime, then he'll lose even more bone support as a result. See, everything we have has limited longevity. If you get a hip implant, notice when you when you see the doctor and you're deciding on a hip implant, the doctor wants you to go as long as possible with your current hip before he or she does a hip implant. Why? Because the hip implant suffers through wear and tear, which means that that hip implant may need to be replaced and may not be as comfortable as... Uh, um, uh, 20 years from now, in fact, they fail between 15 and 20 years, as they, as they are right now. And so the doctor is trying to delay the removal of the old hip for a long enough period of time that you're going to succeed in the new hip for the rest of your life. It's the same way with dental implants. We don't expect dental implants to last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Sometimes they might, but we don't expect that. And so we're, what we're doing is managing teeth, trying to keep a tooth or trying to keep a series of teeth for as long as we can until we need to go to the next phase. Well, you know, one of the things I've often thought about, Lee, is when do we make a decision as to extract a tooth or extract a tooth and put a, a, you know, a tooth-to-tooth -tooth replacement in or do a dental implant or do a lot of things. But you just wrote a recent article for uh, our uh, newsletter for uh, Senior Scene Magazine, and I, I, I thought you, uh, you covered something in that article that made me think about uh, flossing our teeth. And you didn't talk about flossing in the article. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, the length and breadth of a front tooth, and then you talked about uh, people that go to a dentist and continually get um, crown replacements. And, and the crown replacements are primarily on the back teeth, correct? Um, they can be both in the back and the front. You probably do see them more in the back, yes. Okay. But what was the essence of the two points that you were trying to make in that article? Well, I think the first point is this. And that is that sometimes we re we deal with short teeth. All right, let me give you the premise of the article first. So the premise of the article is that people are running around with very short teeth. If the teeth are short in the back, then they don't hold crowns very well, and that's why crowns fall off. If they're short in the front, then you end up with a gummy smile. And the thought is, I have short teeth. But in essence, that's not what's occurring at all. It isn't that the teeth are short. It's that the patient has too much gum and too much bone around the tooth, and so not much of the tooth is sticking out in the mouth. So by having a very, very short tooth, uh, it, looks, it doesn't look very good in the front, and it doesn't hold on to a restoration, a crown restoration in the back because it's so short. And we think that the patient or the, or, or the person will see, say, well, that's the way I am. I'm born with short teeth. When, in fact, all we have to do is do some minor surgery around the tooth, and we'll be able to give you the correct length tooth remove a little bit of the excess gum, remove some of the excess bone, and we recreate the tooth that you should have had to begin with. Well, you know, you and I have talked about one of the most important things that a person can do for, 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 for basic and also good uh, dental health is flossing. Yeah. And, but, you know, in all the years that you and I have been doing these radio shows, Lee, and, and so many people say, well, how can you keep talking about dental techniques and practices, and, and why is it important to discuss these things on a, on a 
sort of a regular basis. And here's one of the reasons that I, I, I like that is because when I read the article you wrote for the paper, I could understand what you're talking about, the length and breadth of a short tooth and having to ex- make more tooth available so you could do something with it. But I also got to thinking about if I've never, um, I guess I've never had to worry about um, re- uh, taking gum away to expo- expose more tooth to put a crown on. But if if you have short teeth and... And like you said, no matter what type of cement you use, uh, you can keep that crown in there. If a person aggressively flosses and, uh, you know, if you go back and forth or up and down on that tooth, if you have a short tooth, you have more propensity to to catch the edge of that crown and pull it off. Am I right or not? You're absolutely right, yes. Well, how do you... How do you re- how do we tell people how to correctly floss their teeth? Well, I think th- there's a few things. Let me let me add on to what you said because I think what you said is very very important. A patient has a person. Patient. A patient is somebody who I see. <laughs> all, all the people listening here are not patients; they are people. A person can only clean what he or she can clean. And if the tooth is very, very short, you can't clean below the gum line because the gum line is in the way of your cleaning the tooth. In addition, if you have a very short tooth, the decay that a person ordinarily gets between the teeth is usually in an area where you can take care of it. But uh, for the person with a short tooth, there's excess gum tissue and that means the decay is buried below the gum line. It makes it difficult for the dentist to take care of the decay. And it makes it difficult for the patient to floss in the area where the decay was because it's so deeply below the gum line, you can't get to floss that teeth. So there becomes a real problem for the patient in management, managing, managing that problem. If the dentist finds that the decay is very deeply below the gum line, the dentist should do the best that he or she can to remove all of the decay. That's important. But if the decay is buried below the gum line, the decay is not only going to cause a tooth issue, it's going to cause a gum issue. If the patient is then referred to a periodontist to take care of that gum issue, where surgically the gum tissue and the bone underneath that is re-sculpted, that patient has a much better chance of not only saving the tooth, but preserving the tooth in health and also eliminating all of this bacteria that's stuck below the gum line, which results in bad breath. So you reduce gum bleeding, you reduce the chance of new decay, and you end up with something looking good all at the same time. Well, in the article, you talked about sculpting. And yes. I, I, I took the sculpting to mean, and I, I, I want to make sure I understood this. Were you saying in your article for publication that a good periodontist can actually uh, carve around the tooth surgically to make more bone available so that several things can happen? We do a better job of cleaning our teeth. We can do a better job of uh, actually preparing the tooth for a crown restoration. And, and we can do uh, other items that would affect dental health care. It's true. And you know who's experienced it? No. You. You mean when I have my implants? That's right. The same type of procedure that I needed to do on you and, by the way, for all listeners, Joe has talked about the surgical procedures that we've done uh, a lot on the air. So I'm not revealing any confidences that, that I'm not violating HIPAA laws. I think, Joe, you're giving me permission to, to talk about your case. Is that correct? 
Yeah, you can talk about my teeth. Anybody would go in there and put as much bone back in my teeth as you did so that you had to go back in there and carve more bone now so that you could get get the dental implant. I said, yeah, you could talk about me. You, you did everything you could to make me come back and get more money out of me. Yeah, you did. That, that was the whole reason. I did it for the money. <laughs> so <clears throat> when you had your procedure done, and you decided to grow more bone around the implant than I ever intended, essentially what did I have to do? I had to make an incision, and I had to remove some of that excess bone. Otherwise, the tooth would have been too short. There would have been other problems as well, but the tooth would have been too short. So the procedures that I did around your dental implants, which you can describe, you can say it was horrible, it was okay. I mean, you can say whatever you want. But the procedures I did around your dental implants to, in order to make them okay for restoration, in other words, okay for crowns on the dental implant, is the same type of procedure that we're talking about doing around natural teeth. So now I'll interview you. When I had to expose that bone for you, okay, when I made that incision and when I had to, um, exp- I had to remove some bone in order to be able to find or to expose the dental implant, how bad or how good was that procedure for you? I don't know. Do you remember it as being painful? No, no, it wasn't painful. Okay. Do you remember it being uncomfortable? You didn't feel anything while I did the procedure. No, I, I didn't feel a thing. Right? I, I have to compliment you on the shots you gave because, no, I'm terrified of a needle in my mouth. I don't like it at all. Yeah. But I know that, uh, and when we finished that, I even thanked you. Or the way you gave the shots, because, you know, uh, some dentists kind of massage your jaw. Some take your lips and move them all around, and they squish your face all up so that so that uh, your face hurts, and they don't know when they stick you in the gum with a needle. Uh, but you gave a very good shot that, uh, that I didn't feel, Lee. Eh? Well, thank you. And by the way, in this uh, today, because we're not going to talk too much about short teeth, I do want to talk about how to give a shot. We can talk about injection technique and and why some injections are more comfortable than others. So, you know, after the break, after the 12.30 break, let's talk about that. Um, But in the meantime, let's look at what was accomplished. So I put the dental implant in. You needed some bone grafting material. I put the bone grafting material in. You grew more bone than I intended. I then had to make an incision, which I was going to do anyway, to be able to find the dental implant. Find the dental implant is buried below about two millimeters of bone. And with a regular dental drill, which sounds horrible, but it's not, with a regular dental drill, I removed the excess bone so we could use the implant successfully. You were in the chair to do this. You were totally comfortable because you were numb. You were in the chair probably 45 minutes, probably no longer than that for us to expose the expose the dental implant. You probably had three or four stitches in place which came out by themselves. And that was the end of it. You didn't tell me it cut me so bad I had to have stitches. <laughs> That's because they melted away. I didn't if I didn't tell you, I apologize. You should have known. Yeah, well, that would have given me grounds for a lawsuit. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is not the legal day. This is the dental day. Yeah, I'm not going to have more money from my nonprofit. <laughs> by the way, by the way, let's just get off the subject of dentistry just for a minute. Okay. You know, well, it's, it is connected with dentistry because there are so many practices that, that people need to have done and... Some of them can be obtained um, at a lesser cost than others. Yep. But I think we have to measure what it is that we want in the long run. And I've talked to you about the subject of dental insurance over the years. Some dentists accept dental insurance, some do not. That's yep. their prerogative to do whatever they want. But over the last couple of years, since I've been involved more with the uh, Helping Seniors program, and I get so many calls. And by the way, folks, one of the largest calls, numbers of calls we get at Helping Seniors 
is for dental assistance. People simply do not have a way to pay for dental procedures. A number of people have the work done and they want to know if I could find a way to help them pay for it. I, I can't do that. I mean, there just is no source that I'm aware of for, for helping uh, somebody do that. If somebody has a way, I would appreciate you call me at, uh, I'll give you two numbers. You can call me at the number of the station at uh, 722-9998, or you can call me at the office at uh, 321-473-7770, because, you know, like you, I'm always uh, uh, ready and willing to accept new sources of help. And the way we, we, we do this, Lee, is we, we have talk radio shows like this. We do our television. We do our newspaper articles. And we find out from each other because no one has a uh, a lock on information. And uh, I, over the years, the shows you and I have done, whether we, we joke about something or whether we're serious about it, uh, we've been able to uh, sometimes make somebody aware of how they can be helped. But let's get back to, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and talking about dental insurance just for a minute, I have I have come to find out that uh, there you have to understand what the fine print says in any contract, and I have been doing some investigating on what uh, dentists accept in a way accept in a way of. Uh, insurance policies, and I found out that uh, some dental insurance policies can be extremely imp- uh, uh, expensive, when I say extremely imp- uh, uh, expensive, when you talk about adding on a cost of $150 a month per person in a family for dental insurance on top of medical insurance, it can be extremely expensive, and I found out that if you, you measure the cost of extensive procedures, more likely it would be that the expensive procedure that you might have to have during your lifetime, and dental implants is probably one of the most uh, needed procedures for which people don't prepare. Is, am I fairly accurate in making that assessment, Steve? Statement, Steve? I think so. I think, uh, you know, running neck and neck with that, Joe, is people, and we talked about this two months ago, Yeah. people extracting teeth too quickly in favor of dental implants, that we're ignoring the fact that teeth can be saved, and we're thinking that a dental implant it might be a better solution than a, than a tooth that we fix. And, and, in fact, that's not always the case. I agree. I agree, and I think that I think we have to pay extremely important uh, 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 have to pay attention attention to what we need for good overall body health care. And one thing I would like to talk about, uh, Doctor Sheldon, when we come back from the break, which we're going to take in a couple of seconds here, is the impact of improper dental care on the rest of the body being able to uh, develop a, um, a more wholesome outlook for uh, a better quality of life. And I, and I know you have some thoughts on that, so I would really, really like to talk about that this morning because I think it's important because of the age group that we reach on this uh, radio network. So can we talk about that when we come back? I look forward to it, Joe, yes. All right. We're going to take a mid-show break, folks, right now. Uh, stay with us because Dr. Shelson, I like his thoughts on nutrition and the effect of salt, sugar, and everything else. And I don't think enough can be said about it. So come back and stay with us for the next half hour. 1234 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM. It's Wednesday, Joe Steckler Day, helping seniors of Brevard. And now with more of the show, here's your host, Joe Steckler. Thank you, John. And we're back live with our uh, our guest today, Dr. Sheldon, who is a periodontist, not an orthodontist, as I said. Uh, half the time I can't hear what anybody says to me. So I, a periodontist and orthodontist, I know they're different, but they sound the same, Lee. No, we're different. 
I know you're know different. How to move teeth. And especially in your case, I know that they are different. <laughs> Very different. Folks, all kidding aside, helping seniors, it's designed to inform and educate and help connect people with the right kind of services they need. And we, we do this is through our our sponsors and the car raffle we're having now. And we're two weeks out now on the car raffle at the American Muscle Car Museum on 27 April. And uh, uh, the number of ticket orders is, is starting to increase. And the people that we sent tickets to are are sending tickets back in, and uh, I, I'm very pleased because it shows a lot of community support. And, and the way nonprofits are going to exist in the future is through community support and having a good business plan. Uh, contrary to what a lot of commissioners may believe or feel or think, nonprofits are especially valuable to the life of of a community. Uh, we do a lot of things that uh, there is nothing uh, written up in a county budget about it, a county uh, referendum or planning document or anything else. Uh, somehow it seems to me that uh, counties want to just rely on somebody else to do something for them. And um, if you think about it, those of you listening to the radio show, many of you know that Many of our Burrard Countyans are implants from up north. They have uh, much higher taxes. We have no ta state income tax. But if you've got to have programs that help seniors, you have to pay for them some way. And if you don't have general revenue tax funds that uh, go to the uh, solution of some of these problems, uh, you're, you're going to have problems. And... You've got to do a better job of, of helping that. And completely off the subject of dentistry, I do know that Dr. Sheldon has had a tremendous uh, program where he has uh, selected several charities and people come in for dental exams. And I'll let you explain it, Dr. Sheldon, because not only do you support the community, but you are helping increase, uh, I would say, attracting people to come in for examinations to improve their own dental health care as well as the general health care of the community. Make sense? Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, our charitable giving campaign is part of that. And i, I, I got to tell you the origin. You might, I've never talked about the origin of the, or of the charitable giving campaign. You mind if I talk about that? Go ahead. So... The price of a dental examination kept on going up and up and up in our office, every place. You know, the more things that you need to do, the more you have to charge for it. So we got to the point where we had a CAT scan in the office. You know, a CAT scan cost me quite a bit of money to buy. Um, so I had to charge a fee in order to be able to cover my costs. I mean, we all do. I mean, business is business. So we got to the point where we were charging in excess of $400 for an examination. Well, it was probably worth it, but there are a certain number of people who say, $400 for an examination? Are you kidding me? All I want to do is find out a blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to spend $400 for that. And I got very uncomfortable. Because while it costs a lot of money to do dentistry correctly, it does. Not everybody who walks into our office is ready to have that kind of dentistry done. You know, they want to find out more about what's going on in their mouth. They want to find out whether they like me. They want to find out whether they like our staff, our doctors. You know, is this the place they want to get that work done? And at $400... A certain number of people say, well, the heck with that. I'm not going to spend $400 to even find out. That was part of it. The other part of it was that there are a number of charities, including Helping Seniors of Brevard County, 
who need money. And there are a certain number of people who will come into our office simply as a result of the fact that they can make a charitable donation and get the examination done. Others said, well, I'm not going to spend $400, but I'm willing to spend $50 to charity it to, to come in. You know, that, that sounds like a good thing. And so that's what we did. And we changed it to anybody who's referred to our office or anybody who's listening to this radio program come, can come into our office for $50 or more to one of the eight charities in our charitable giving campaign. And helping seniors of Brevard County is one of them. We also have uh, charities that we support uh, for pets and for younger kids and and developmentally challenged kids. So th- there there is a charity for everyone in our charitable giving campaign. And essentially what you do is check off the box the, the, the charity you want to support. You write a check for $50 or more to that charity. And you get the CT scan, the full mouth series of x-rays, the examination, um, uh, and no charge. Well, I didn't know how far it would take off. I said, all right, it's a good idea. I feel good about this, and I'm, I'm sick of charging people too much money for the examination. What I didn't realize was the effect the campaign would have. Directly as a result of that campaign, you and I are on radio once a month. Directly as a result of that campaign, I had a newspaper column for five and a half years in Florida today. Directly as a result of that charitable giving campaign, I've gotten awards from three different charities for leadership in health care or for something something along that line. So when I'm talking, because you know I, I run a consulting group for, 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 for dentists as well, when I... Ask that when I, I say consider putting in the charitable giving campaign, you never do it in order to be able to get all of the recognition that I've had. But as a result of doing it, not only have I gotten more recognition and become more popular in the area, but we've collected one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for charity, and I never lost a dime as a result of doing it. It was such a win-win for everyone, including the charities, that it's something that I perpetuate, and it's something that I'm teaching other periodontists to do all over the country. Well, I know that the charities thank you, Leah. I, I, I really wanted the story to come out because I think more people, if they, if they know how their money's being used. Uh, We'll give it to a, a campaign. Uh, several weeks ago, I, I made a commitment myself that I would try to do a better job of um, trying to put something into place that would be a lasting uh, uh, effort to uh, continually help people in Broward County. And I, 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 I put the words to it in the uh, hometown news, newspaper about... Uh, developing a charitable endowment for seniors. Um, and I told the seniors in the article that I would, we would uh, put what was in the uh, endowment the week before and what was in the current week. Well, uh, we didn't exactly make it very clear in the paper, and we attached uh, a number to the, the title of the article, which had nothing to do with it, but I talked to our, my, our writer yesterday and we're going to do it a little bit different. And I've had some many people have called and said, Joe, why don't you put the telephone number and the address for helping seniors in your article, in your byline, so that people will know how to make a donation to this charity? And I said, I would be happy to do that. And just so you know, folks, uh, we have started to get uh, checks for twenty-five, fifty. I have one check for $500. Uh, to be placed into this endowment to help people because people that are are, uh, familiar with endowments know that if an endowment is correctly uh, developed and its instrumentation as to how it can be used, 
a, a board really cannot destroy that endowment what it's put it's put in place. So uh, we have an attorney working on that to make sure that it is something that will continue. My point here, Lee, is that uh, people like you that start programs like this, uh, if we do a better job on our radio and television shows and talking about how some of this is money can be used once we develop the wherewithal to make awards out of an endowment. We can do a lot to help people. Um, I'm sure you've had people come into your practice with such terrible mouths that it would require almost a whole complete mouth reconstruction in order to even walk out of there and with you feeling comfortable that you had done the right thing for the people. Yet, uh, Sometimes we find that people come to expect things to be done for them without their having made a significant effort. But as I told people in one of the articles I wrote, if they thought about the power, the collective power of 165,000 seniors over the age of 65 doing a little bit each to contribute to something like this on an annual basis, the amount of money that could be amassed and operated correctly to help people. Someplace, Lee, this is like a guy or a woman comes in and sits down in your dental chair, and you tell them to open their mouth, and you start in there with your probes and you look at your glass, your, your 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 thing on your head where you can see into their eyes. And you, I mean, you got those uh, fantastic glasses now that you can see everything. Um, it's a sign of advanced times. And one thing I think that I would like more people to know about when we talk about going to uh, doctors and dentists that have invested in equipment themselves uh, a lot of people don't think about the cost of x-rays, the cost of uh, CT scans. And they, if, if we have to send somebody out to somebody else, it takes time. You don't know what they're doing. But if you got the equipment yourself, you operate it yourself, you know what you're seeing. So how do you think that all relates to our ability to do a better job of diagnosing not only tooth care, but overall care since we are now, as we are now understanding the, the ties between correct dental care and overall body care, namely heart care and some of the internal organs of the body, Lee. Well, I think I'd answer it first with a sentence. And that is, the sentence would be, the mind precedes the diagnosis. What do I mean by that? It means that I need to know what I'm looking for before I use the diagnostic instrument to find what I'm looking for. If I presume that something is there, I may find it. And if I have an open mind... I might say, oh, I thought it was this, but it was really that. I'll give you an example. I saw a patient last week who I kind of knew a little bit, but um, um, he had gone in for an examination to another dentist. And I'm not trying to diss other dentists, but at the same time, this was a significant event for him. So he sees the other dentist, had not seen a dentist for three or four years. The dentist does the examination that he does. The patient has a toothache. The dentist suggests that that tooth come out and that two implants be placed, one on one area and one someplace else. The guy says, I want to see Lee for a second opinion. So I do my CT scan, and we do our x-rays, and I find that the tooth needs a root canal, 
but it can be saved, and he doesn't need one of those two dental implants if we do that. So what's the difference between what I said and what the other guy said? <clears throat> well, the other guy presumed that the tooth cannot be saved in health. And therefore, he said, let's extract it and put in two dental implants. And I looked at it and I said, you know, with my experience, having seen Keith like this for a long time, I know that that tooth can be saved in health if we do a root canal, and we do some gum surgery around the tooth. Now, the other dentist may have had the same diagnostic equipment that I had, but we came to two different conclusions. So how do you reconcile that? You know, and, and that's why I'm say, saying the mind precedes the diagnosis or the diagnostic equipment. Well, if I was the guy that had that, that examination done on me, I would opt to see what I could do to save a tooth. Of course. Number one, <clears throat> just from a financial standpoint, he probably saved, it, it, it's probably going to cost him half to do what I'm recommending as the other guy. You know, people say I'm expensive, and maybe I am, <laughs> but <laughs> expensive for what? <clears throat> He's going to save. He's going to save. He's going to save half the money he would have spent. All right. So I may charge more for an individual procedure because I need to take a little bit of extra time or whatever in order to be able to do it. But we end up with a better. You know, we'll end up with a better, uh, long-lasting result. And of course, the patient appreciated the right, that right away. Okay. Give another example. We don't have a lot of time left, yeah. but I, I, the one thing I do not have the uh, advantage of, and I'm trying to correct this, is that we have not had a number, a large number of doctors on the show because, and I think that's a, a, a failure on my part because I think uh, bringing more of, more of the uh, general practitioners on the show as well as uh, general, I guess, I, I, I guess, I've been to so many different eye specialists, I guess might say just a general eye practitioner on the show. Uh, and I've had one, Dr. Uh, Mike Mendezi on. Um, but we need to have more of our our general practitioners as well as our specialists on the radio show so that our listeners get a uh, sort of a hands-on explanation of what uh, specialists and general practitioners not only are capable of, but what they have to analyze in their own mind as the types of recommended courses of action. And having said that, I know that you believe that uh, good eating habits at an early age are uh, very, very uh, major contributing factors to overall health care. And uh, I would like for you to just to discuss that with our listening audience a little bit today because a lot of our listening audience are grandparents and it can certainly have an effect on how they can t talk to their children about their grandchildren. Yeah, it's true. And given the fact that I saw that 16-year-old that I talked about before the break, it's very fresh in my mind right now that you know, grandparents, sometimes you know a lot more than your kids know, <laughs> and you can help your grandkids a lot better. Because grandparents, you grew up with good nutrition, and you know what? Sometimes your kids didn't. So I think you have to go back to what it was like when you were a kid. All right, I'm 68 years old. Go back to what it was like when I was a kid in order to be able to help your children um, provide the 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 nutritional care that they need because remember when you were a kid there was no such thing as organic why because everything was grown without fertilizer you know everything was organic when we were kids you would go to the gas station and there might be one coke machine now you go to 7-eleven and you have refrigerators full of that sugary stuff it's a new normal and the new normal today is not the new is not the normal that we grew up with when we were kids. And there are some that are predicting 
that our lifespan is going down, not up, simply because of the way we're taking care of ourselves. So even though we last a few years longer than we did when we were kids, um, that trend is going down simply because of what we're doing to ourselves. And you can teach your kids and your grandkids how it used to be. It's not so bad. Well, one of the things that bothers me, uh, Dr. Sheldon, is that, uh, you know, we have so many illnesses that uh, seniors uh, go through that um, sometimes you ask a senior, well, what it was wrong? And they say, well, the doctor diagnosed me with fibromyalgia. And when you ask somebody what fibromyalgia is, you get all kinds of answers. You get all kinds of answers about what the pain is, or levels of pain, uh, what it what it means to the uh, ability of the of the person to function normally. And I have found, and I've been asked by a number of people to start a support group uh, for for my for for fibromyalgia patients. And I I looked into it, and I think there's. There might be one group in Brevard County. Here we're talking about a, a county of over 645,000 people. And we may have one support group for, the, for a disease that uh, doctors are very quick to use as a, di- diagnose, diagnose, uh, di- as a diagnosis. And uh, we don't really understand what fibromyalgia is other than it is having having habit been diagnosed with it myself it hurts like hell yep. and uh you know i i just i you know i if somebody says joe you don't hurt i say you're crazy than hell i do hurt and it may not a person may not look like they hurt but i can tell you the i have seen people uh walking the streets of Aurora county knowing they are in tremendous pain Yet they do their very, very best not to show it. So sometimes I I wonder how we can do a better job ourselves of trying to tell our doctors how we feel, what are the cause and effect relationships of some of the medications and a, on a lifestyle that we try to live. Uh, as a doctor, you're a dentist, but you're still a doctor. Uh, what kind of thought have you given to that over the years? Well, I've talked to a number of people about that, and of course, fibromyalgia is a catch-all term. You're 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 fully correct. It's not a diagnosis. It's what's left after you, when you can't figure out what's going on. So I've seen fibromyalgia attacked, or at least um, 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 treated with hormonal therapy. I've seen it treated with chiropractic. I've seen it treated with TMJ therapy. I've seen it treated with medications, and probably a lot of other. Um, a lot of other things. I think the first thing is, is not necessarily assume, and I'm not saying this for you, Joe, I know your medical history really well, but don't assume that just because a medical doctor can't figure it out that you have to give up there. There are a number of different disciplines in healthcare that may be able to help you when traditional medicine can't. That's what I wanted you to say. I wanted you to say that, Lee, because I think People need to know we're almost out of time, folks, but what Dr. Sheldon is talking about is extremely important that uh, we don't give up. We continue to try to find out what we can to do. Lee, I'll give you the last word today on today's show. Well, it, we started off with short teeth, and we went into health care, and we went into fibromyalgia. It's a typical show that you and I do, Joe. <laughs> It's always a pleasure. I miss, I miss ha- we're doing this over the phone, folks, and I miss having Dr. Sheldon in the studio because I, 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 I can pretend that Lee is squishing his face up on the other end of the telephone, but you, you don't, you don't understand how this man can make his face muscles go in so many different directions at one time when he manipulates them with his fingers. But it's, <laughs> Talk radio is talk radio, and I'm getting a roundup signal, so we'll see you next week, folks. Bye-bye.